side. So I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord's on my side and takes my part. He is among those who help me. Therefore shall I see my desire established on those who hate me. It is better to trust and take refuge in the Lord than put confidence in man. It is better to trust and take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. You know, when we learn how to put our total trust in God, Things begin to get smooth. The peace of God comes in. Fear's gone. And part of that is having a reverential fear of God. And that helps us stay connected up and walk in obedience to God. And so I want to encourage you, man, in this season, yeah, in the natural, there's all kinds of reasons to be fearful. But according to the word of God, if we will reverently come and worship our God, seek him, put our trust in him, then no fear will even come near us according to Psalms 91. No evil will come near our dwelling. But the key is, first of all, knowing God, knowing who he is and how you fit in the scheme of God, and understand, you know, through the charismatic movement and everything, he was Abba, Father, Daddy, all that, and that's great because he is. But we lost the fact, I think, in some circles that he is God. He is the awesome God. He is the creator of the whole human race and the earth and the galaxies until your leader crosses your will. You will, as long as the leader never crosses your will, you'll never have the test to see how you will follow. Amen, amen. Think about it. As long as everything's copacetic and you got somebody up there giving a three-pointer and we're, you know, we're seeker-friendly and we do that. We don't ever do it. I had somebody tell me just last night, our pastor goes so far, but he would never cross the line. I said, I never got on the other side of the line. <laughs> but you know what they told me? Right out of their mouth. They said, but we're going to come to your church Sunday. I guess they like to be crossed over the line every now and then. Somebody has to cross the line. Somebody has to say, we got to wake up. Somebody has to say, the covenant will work. Somebody's got to say, if you'll bring your tithes and offerings in the storehouse, he'll blow, he, he, will, he will blow your mind with a blessing you can't contain. He'll, you'll be no different than Peter putting the, the, the net on the other side of the boat. He didn't argue with God. He just moved his net eight feet. And all of a sudden, he had more than he could contain. It broke his nets. Why? He walked in obedience to the voice of the living God. Oh, praise God. Whoo, I'm stirred up tonight. I, I mean, the reason I'm saying this, you have covenant rights. Don't be deceived. Don't let some thought talk you out of going. And God said, test him. So why don't you start testing him? I know a lot of you test him and, and give. Don't get me wrong. But maybe in this season, maybe God's calling us to a new level. Maybe the test is greater than ever. Mm. Whoo! Don't y'all believe? Does everybody in here believe God's the true and living God, that he only tells the truth? Do you think his, he's got your best interest at heart? Do you believe that if you can just get past your own past life, your own thoughts, your own wounds, the time that you thought you was giving and nothing happened? Let me tell you, maybe it's being getting stacked up and built up for now. Amen? And I know we got givers. I know we're way, way above the national average of giving. I know we are, but I want us to be on the top. I want us to be the cream. I want this group of 
People here can give testimony after testimony of what in the world God did because of obedience to the word of the living God. Amen? So, if you're on a fixed income, let's get it unfixed. Let's get some supernatural increase that you're believing beyond your fixed income. Why can't we? Huh? Can we? Uh, it's not un, it, 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 that's not beyond God. God said, test him and try him, that he wouldn't pour you out a blessing you could not contain. And I think it goes far beyond finance. I think it goes far beyond finance. So I love you. I mean, I, I'm not getting on you. I'm excited for you. Because you know why? I know you're the people God called to be here and to live in this season. And I know that you will trust him to the uttermost. Amen? And you'll have a leader that will do the same. We walk so close to the line all the time. <laughs> it's so much fun. It is so much fun to see the hand of God every time. You still got a testimony? Oh, man. Let's hear it, Brother Ron. Come up here. I hope I don't blow the amp up. I'm going to hold the mic. No, I'm teasing. He's scared, I know. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm not going to preach. Oh, I've got a testimony. I'm dead free. Hallelujah. Praise I gave God. my way out of debt. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, there hasn't been a time, a service I've been in this church, even from the beginning, that I haven't given. Amen. Like last week, I came in late because of work, and I had to chase the guys with the money bag down the hall to get some money in there. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it worked. I got I got money in my pocket. I got money in my checking accounts. I, I, all the bills are paid. And I got checks coming in the mail. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Praise God. See? See? What we believe, what it still lies in the realm of the unseen, this is faith. Now, the reason we can say tonight when we sow, we're debt free, even though there's still some stuff on the ledgers, we're believing by faith. Faith sees into the realm of the unseen. It goes up and retrieves the provision of God. And if you will continue to walk in faith, it will manifest as in the natural debt-free. But you've got to receive it in the Spirit first. You Faith, see the church don't have a clue what faith is. Makes me want to bite this microphone in half. The reason I'm saying that, faith is receiving the promise of God while it's still in the unseen. And it says in the Bible, after you receive it, you don't need faith for it anymore because it's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but you understand what I'm saying. So what we're going to do is begin to trust God and be as happy when we once release faith, a joy comes provision comes and we're going to be as excited right then as when it comes over into the bank account because it's in the bank of heaven we made a deposit your faith will release it and it will manifest in this life amen I'm telling you I'm excited I'm fired up I got a call from a woman hadn't called me my niece in 30 years yesterday she said Uncle Richard I have got to talk to you something's happening to me God's moving on me I'm having dreams every night they're all from God I got to know God more I got to get into the things of God and this is out of Tulsa Oklahoma now listen to me God's doing that. And then Brother Robert Speck, the one that got healed, and all the sores were healed on his legs, uh, that I was in the house in Phoenix, he told me again this week, he said, Man, since you've been here, God has filled my house. I cannot tell you what's happening in this house. It is so good and so great. I delivered his screens down there we had made for him. And, and he's saying, God has been in the house ever since you left. You see, you leave a deposit. The great...
commission. Come in, cast the demons out. Lay hands on the sick. That's what we did. We led him to the Lord. God moved. His legs are healed. He's out of the wheelchair. His sores that was seeping for a year and a half are welled. New skin growing on his leg. Let me tell you something. Get out. Trust God. Put a test on the things of God. It'll come about, won't it? I guarantee you. And you're just the ones to do it. You've been getting this. You've been getting this for years. Now get out and make a deposit. She said, Uncle Richard, I, I, I'm having these dreams. I'm doing this. I'm going. And said, I've run into this woman named Sue. She graduated from Rama. And I and she she and I said, Well, that's a good one to run into. And I said, now, she told me all this. She said, I don't understand these things. I know they're from God. And she's sharing some. I said, yeah, they're from God. I can tell you what this is and that. And I said, but you should be able to know that yourself. I said, have you ever been baptized in the Holy Ghost? She said, I was baptized at Godly Texas. I said, no. She'd been going to a Methodist church 22 years. I said, I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm talking about baptism of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I said, I'm not talking about some theology that everybody's baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about a Bible theology that says it's a second blessing and when you get born again, then you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and the evidence is speaking in tongues. Have you had that? No, Uncle Richard, I haven't, but I think I need it. I said, you go to Sue tomorrow. When you can, y'all get before God and stay there and you get baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and then call me back. Woo! 30 years we've been believing for her. Don't give up now. God's moving sovereignly on people. She was laying in her bed. It wasn't in a church. Begin to give her dreams and come to her. Ignite a fire that she wants to know God deeper and better than ever before. She's radical already. Don't think we're in the same season we were last year or 10 years ago. This ain't just having church. This is coming alive and standing up and letting God be God. Going into strangers' houses and letting God loose in there and they come back and call you, oh, Richard, we just love you. They'll do the same for you. Don't act like you used to. I used to not go into strange houses and the first thing you talk about, I think you know God. I think you need to know God. And they say, we've been thinking about that. I think I need to know God too. And they just roll over. I mean, and you just deliver the anointing of God. They get healed, set free, guys. Quit thinking like we used to. The world is ready. They're open. They want to know our God. You see. God is God. He's alive. And he chose you for this season. Quit acting like we're stupid. Jesse DePlanta said last week, I was watching him in Hawaii. He said, there's a major bad spirit of stupid on the church. (laughs) Jesse said it. I didn't say it. Okay, the teenagers can go. They've arrived. See, I took up the time till you got here. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to give. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'll catch him later. What is it? Okay, the kids can be released. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you may want to write another check. them gone you see without passion without understanding without the word matter of fact Corina and I is talking you're going to get to do this later but not tonight she said that she is in Amos 7-7 
God was showing her the plumb, the plumb line. That's where it talks about the plumb line. And that plumb line has to be set against a standard. And the thing about it is a plumb line can always hang there, but if you don't have a standard for it to work against, you'll never know if you're upright. And what we've allowed in the church is a standard to be moved to meet men's ideas instead of God's will. One of them is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's just take that part out. And then when that part's taken out because that's part of the standard, then your plumb line will not hang right and you'll be off center and you will not flow the way you're supposed to flow in this house. And your house will be out of order and it might fall off the foundation because it's going to give a wrong reading for the plumb line. The standard I used to teach on how to know the will of God and the voice of God and how to be led by the Spirit. And I used NASA as an example. And I said, at NASA, in the, down there in NASA and in Houston, and then they'd have Cape Canaveral or Kennedy or whatever it is now. They'd have the rocket ship sitting out on the pad. There would be a master computer at the headquarters in Houston. There would be an onboard computer in the rocket ship on the pad. They had, everything would be programmed in the master computer. The computer on board would have to know and be hooked up and recognize a master computer. The minute they push the button for ignition and the minute you get born again, you launch off the pad. But you've been, the born again experience hooks you up with the master computer, the Bible, the word of the, it says you must hear the gospel so faith can come for salvation faith. But then there's another kind of faith and there's another kind of leading. The Holy Spirit is the onboard computer. And if you take the plumb line, you take the standard out, then on board when you launch after you get born again, you won't know when you get off track unless you're born of the Spirit of the living God with the baptism of the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit is hooked up with the master computer, the Bible, it will only the Holy Spirit only operates in line with the written Word of God. So when you launch out and you go out in the Great Commission and you begin to do things, if your computer on board has been violated and it's not reading the master computer right, you'll get all messed up and you won't know and you'll lose track. And you can be off a, 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 about an inch on that pad after it launches and time you get to the moon, you'll miss the moon because you've been going off course the whole time. If you're properly wired to know and hear the living word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. If you know, the, if you're rightly discerning the word of God, if you're workman not to be put ashamed, you study, you know the word of God, then that master computer begins, your Holy Spirit, your spirit, the human spirit, begins to pick up on what you're supposed to do. And through this race of life, after the button's pushed, the reason there's so many stupid Christians the spirit of stupid is their master computer they're hooked up to. They've even taken away, added to, done away because it wasn't politically correct. And so we don't know what's going on because every time that computer on board, unless it's wired right, unless you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, unless you're wired up right, you won't know what to do when you come into crisis. So what I'm saying is this. You know what amazes me about human beings? They can come to a word church, spirit-filled church, where they're putting the word of the living God out. They've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but they've never studied the way they should. And one little stupid offense... They go back and revert back to the Baptist church. Now think about it a minute. 
and them Baptists are good. They get a lot of people born again. They, what the Baptists do, they set them up so we can get them filled up. <laughs> they, they provided more people in the charismatic movement other than Catholics than anybody. But what I'm saying is this. But my God, after you get out of kindergarten, after you're supposed to be in your 16th year medical school, don't go back to the first grade. Hallelujah. Aren't y'all excited? Because why I'm saying this, it says, listen to this. It said, protect your heart, what you hear, for that's where the issues of life come from. And people will just sit under anything because their skin's so thin they can't take any correction. Some of you's already mad. I don't care. Get mad as you want to. I'm called to deliver the word. You're called to receive it and grow. <laughs> you say, well, that, well, listen, I was just telling Justin tonight, I'm working on 40 years now doing my best to hear God, serve God. I'm coming up. That was before I went to Raymond, and after I got to Raymond, we started, and we I am nearly got 40 years service. And I've seen a lot of spirit of stupid. And the thing about it is, I don't want that because it affects human beings, and whenever they get offended and they won't come and be corrected and let God heal them and set them free... They'll wind up shipwrecked down the road somewhere and not even in a body and not serving God because the offense they take on, they won't get rid of it. I'm building up to taking the offering. <laughs> yeah, tonight. Now, the... I'm not mad. Don't get. I'm. I'm. I am like a shepherd trying to protect the sheep to keep from deception robbing us any longer. We've been deceived enough, and we need to come out with all barrels blazing and say, "Satan, you have been defeated in my life, and I am coming out, and I'm going to walk in extreme obedience to God, and His covenant works for me." You see. Amen? And we're just now getting old enough. I told Justin a while ago, I said, I am just now feel like I'm getting ready for the season. You know, people want to go six months or six weeks, think they're ready to conquer everybody in the world. Well, let me tell you, it took about 40 years to get ready for you guys. <laughs> but let me tell you guys, I'm ready. And the reason I'm ready, God set the season he has called us. We've been dressed properly by the Holy Spirit. The Word's been going in us for 40 years. And let me tell you what, it's been going into you. And sometimes it just takes a little Holy Spirit adjustment so that you hit the mark. So I told my niece, I said, you got to get baptized in the Holy Ghost this week. And then call me because I can't do you any good till you go to the next step. Okay, Uncle Richard. I'll call Sue. I'm getting baptized in the Holy Ghost this week. Isn't it good to talk to have some have one student that says they'll do what you say? <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> hey man, I'm just teasing y'all know that. Y'all are some of the best people I ever saw. I'm telling you, under tremendous odds, things that's going in on some of your lives that the enemy is trying to steal your faith. You're standing strong and walking in obedience and letting God be God and get glory in your life. You see, we're not at the end yet. We're just still on the path. Let me tell you something. When that end comes, it's going to be good. It's going to be great. I'm going to tell you it's great right now. I'm so excited. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm not in Phoenix. I'm not going to go down to Phoenix when Victor's here to claim. 
I may have to have you play that song there a while, so you better get ready. I, I laugh every time I, see, I hear that song. Why well, go down to Phoenix when victory's here to claim? <laughs> it's really why I go down defeated, but it sounded like Phoenix. Few people got a word from God on that. Y'all ready to make a declaration? The declarations work. Y'all ready? Okay, let's do it. As we give today's offering, we're believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, businesses and better business, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, interest demolished, I mean debts demolished, (laughs) royalties received, supernatural increase on investments made, souls for our inheritance. It's offering time. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 29, I I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to read this first. Because God was speaking before Jesus ever went to the cross. And he was making a declaration. And the declaration was this. Even though before the cross ever come about, before redemption was attained and bought, he was saying this about you. He was saying... For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil. To give you hope in your final outcome. See, some people get afraid and scared because they don't know about faith or their God. And their final outcome, they're afraid they're going to go down defeated. Let me tell you something. If you will have trust in God before Calvary's cross was ever ever done, before Jesus ever walked, a few thousand years, I don't know exactly how long this was before the cross, but it was a good long time. Our God was saying, I see you. 2011, July, that I've got a future plan for you. I've already got the plan in motion. I'm going to buy your future for you. I'm going to pay for it with my son. I'm going to make sure that the blessing of God come upon you. I'm going to give you revelation of who you are. You'll be able to walk into my presence anytime you want, and you'll find help in time of need. You see. And then he said, after you will earn this, after you come to this place, you'll call out to me and I'll hear you. I'll answer your prayers. I will heed you. Then you will seek me. You'll inquire me out of the necessity. You'll come to me on a daily basis. Your heart will not be hard anymore. I'll put a softness in you. You see. Some of you need to let the Holy Spirit just come right in and just 
massage that hardness it's kind of calloused around your heart let the Holy Spirit begin to move upon you let him begin to let you know wait a minute you don't have to be hard you don't have to be like that anymore I'll just come and I'll help you because I've already got your path planned all you got to do is pray believe God hear the voice and walk on the path you see we need to allow God to be God in our life and let me tell you why when Jesus come to the earth he came with one mission in mind ultimately to conquer Satan and his way in your life and it says that in 1 John 3 8 for this purpose the Son of God Jesus Christ was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil well with God knowing our future because he planned it all the way back in Jeremiah he saw you on this side of the cross knowing that you could have victory every day if you would trust him and walk in his ways then he knew that when you saw his great provision and his love for you and the things that he did for you he knew when you begin to to understand it your heart was softened you got a brand new spirit then he knew that you would begin to call him out of necessity and understand that he would be your only hope and then he would heed your prayers and set you free because of what his son has already done on Calvary's cross he brought an end to the power and the death giving Satan in your life but we must understand that and walk by faith to walk free of that. Do y'all think Jesus accomplished his task? Okay, then, we don't have a problem, do we? Like Schambach used to say, you ain't got no problem. You just need to have faith in God. Isn't it amazing? We face sometimes monumental problems problems sometimes little problems every day it's the small foxes that'll get you it says and the test is will you walk in obedience to the word of God or will you falter I say you'll walk in obedience by faith in the word of God Jesus come as a man we keep building him up as a God but he laid down his God side, the deity, and he only walked this earth as a man. And they said, well, that was Jesus. Well, that's Clark. That, that's J.R. That's Leonard. That's Bruce. That's just, but it says the Godhead moved into you when you accepted Jesus. The full Godhead, it says, in 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, moved in when you accepted him. Why can't we wake up to the fact that Jesus has taken the sting out of Satan and that he has no authority or power over the church anymore? Amen? He came to the earth as a man, and when he defeated Satan, he defeated him as a man so that when he saw you, when the devil looked at you, he knew he had no power over you. Amen. He used the word of God to defeat him. It is written. Who, what are you using? Every time he sticks his head up, do you say, Oh, I remember over in 1 John it's recorded how my Savior defeated you as a man through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit just like you've got. Amen. Amen. So whenever we begin to understand this, we have the same word, the same ability to conquer Satan as Jesus did. He's legally been brought to naught, according to Colossians 2, 13, 14, I believe it is, isn't it? Is that right? I'm sure it is. 
So what I'm saying, why would we be willing with children going to hell in a handbasket, people dying prematurely of diseases that should never have been allowed in the church? Poverty raging around the world, little kids in other parts, in Sudan, other parts of the world dying by the millions of starvation. Why would we allow that to happen when we've been given authority over it and Satan has been brought to naught, to zero, according to Colossians 2? It's because of lack of knowledge and somebody tried something A hundred years ago, some well-meaning pastor tried something and it didn't seem like it worked, so he changed the theology of the Bible because of pride and embarrassment and it came down through the deal that we just have to accept what comes down the pike. That is the biggest lie the devil I ever heard. We have authority and Satan has been stripped of authority. I'm going to show you. God has elevated the church. He brought it to a new level. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Talking about Jesus. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. That's Hebrews 2.14. Now, we need as a church to understand that we are a well-oiled organism called the body of Christ given the power of God with all spiritual armament and warfare that no devil should ever stick his head up in our place. And if it does, take out the sword of the devil that stuck his head up like Goliath and cut his head off. Amen? Philippians 2 but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a serpent, a serpent, (laughs) servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I'll tell you what, we could learn something from that. This man, Jesus, became obedient even to the death of the cross, and we as a church need to become obedient in the same fashion that the will of God is ultimate. That's the number one thing in our life, and nothing else compares compared to the will of God. That's, that's nearly non-existent in the church. Everybody else's will supersedes God's will because it takes effort to do the will of God. It takes sacrifice to do the will of God. It takes time to do the will of God. It takes money to do the will of God. It takes all kinds of things to do the will of God. Are we willing, like Jesus was, to continue the will of God to make sure when this dispensation ends, will faith be found in the earth? And I thought I'd end there. Uh, No, (laughs) I'm not ending yet. What I'm saying is this. I was talking to some people the other day, and I I said our main problem, really, I mean, we, we pray, we seek God, is we need not be self centered. Jesus conquered him by his death in the resurrection. It wasn't just his death. It was he rose again through the power of God. He paid the price. God the Father said he's paid it. Get him out of there. And the spirit of the living God brought him back and brought him back. And people don't realize that the death that he encountered is not death like we think. Yeah, he died physically on the cross. But what was greater than that? Whenever he went to the pit, he was separated from the Father three days. And spiritual death is separation from God the Father. Do 
you understand that? It's a lot more horrible than natural death. Natural death, the sting's been taken out of it. But spiritual separation from God is spiritual death. And we need to understand that. But Jesus paid the price to bring us back. Now, in Colossians 1, we know that Jesus took the keys to hell, death, and the grave. And as a result now, in him, we have victory over hell and the grave. The church has been elevated. It hasn't been put out. I mean, I remember. I remember in Godly, Texas, and and believe it or not, I was a strong young man. And I do, I've told the story before, but I remember how we, and even our good, I'm, I'm named after the pastor. Poverty was nearly elevated. The poorer we looked, the more they thought we were righteous. It was a Pentecostal thing or something. And I just, I was just so disturbed. If we serve a God that owns all the gold and the silver, why don't he share a little of it with us? (laughs) Then I found out that he entrusted us with all of it. And that we were stewards of the kingdom money and that we were given authority to be stewards in this kingdom. And I begin to think about how we have to come out of this. We need to have a true word of God. We need to really know who we are. We need to know what God's will is in the earth. Do we just barely get along? What do we do? We should be the greatest of people on the earth. but with complacency and not willing and not having a passion, the sacrifice is is to get with God long enough through the word of God, through prayer and fasting, that we hear God and then get up and do what he says. See, it's hard to do that. It's hard for me to do it. It's hard to take the time to do it. I don't want to do it sometimes, and that is a deception because if you will... God will honor you and you'll come out victorious and you will be most highly exalted by God because you will bring him glory from what you produce in your life. I think what, I mean, it's amazing whenever I read the Bible and good meaning Christians evidently, I don't know if we really believe Satan's been defeated. Why do we not believe it? Because we've been told it was God's will for certain things to happen to us that wasn't God's will at all. It was because we had walked out from under the umbrella of his protection, we let our shield of faith down, we allowed the devil to come in, and then we just say because we meet a tragedy or something comes upon us, we say, well, I guess it was God's will. He's teaching me something. He ain't teaching you nothing. You will learn through it if you live through it. But what I'm saying is this, and God will turn those situations around and make good out of them if you will come back to him and repent and acknowledge your responsibility. But what it is, nobody wants to acknowledge your responsibility and the fallacy and the thing that was bad that happened. They want to just go off, roll over, and go down the road till something major happens. Am I making myself clear? So if you're a mature, grown man or woman of God, I mean, people call me that's been around God for 30 years over the most trivia things I ever heard in my life. I was so mad. People call me over the most foolish, stupid things that somebody's been in church 40 years shouldn't even give a iota hoot about. Doesn't it bother you to think that the spirit of stupidity is working on the church?
I don't want him to be called about no cakes, muffins, peanut brittle. If you run out of gas down at Walmart, call somebody else. I've got a group of men and women here that want to go further than that. That want to get past this situation. That wants to grow spiritually. Wants to make impact in this generation. And let me tell you something. If you don't do it, it won't happen. (laughs) It's funny when I think about it. why I got this haircut. What I'm saying is, we need to grow, don't we? Don't we need to mature in the things of God? Don't we need to let God be God and understand that Jesus came to defeat the works of the devil? We don't have to play in them. We can stand up instead of making excuses and say, devil, you've been defeated. Get off this deal. In Jesus' name. Instead of whining around, well, you know what, you know how it was, you, you know I was in a tough situation, well, shut your mouth. Jesus is in a pretty tough situation in the Garden of Gethsemane, but what did he choose? The will of the Father. What I'm saying, y'all don't get mad at me right yet, but I mean, what I'm saying is, we need to understand our positions We're not looked at from God as just like we look at one another, little old people walking around trying to get from Monday to Friday, get another paycheck. Uh, He's looking at us as a voice of God in the earth. He's looking at about probably 5 billion people that don't know him yet that's still living right now. You know, he's, he's looking at us as being empowered by the Holy Ghost and the word of the living God to stand up against any Goliath that comes toward us and cut their head off because we've been with him, you see. So, in Colossians 1.13, he began to speak about and he was beginning to elevate the church. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Have you been delivered from the power of darkness? Legally you have, but unless you know that and walk by faith, it will still try to overlarge you. And he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Romans 8 and 30, moreover, who he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Are you called? Are you justified? Jesus was a manifested glory of God. Who are you? You're the body of Christ. You are the manifested glory of God in the earth today. But we don't see that. We... We, we get too caught up in our own selves and our natural beings instead of our supernatural place that God has placed here on the earth and his supernatural presence inside of us to make a supernatural impact on humanity that's suffering and dying and going to hell. He has raised us up together. How? Not individually. He has raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 2, 6. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you power. There's just something about it. When I walked in Robert Speck's house, instantly, the minute I crossed the threshold, There was a change in the Spirit. There was an opening of the Holy Spirit. It was just like so strong. It was the whole house permeated with the Spirit of God. It was like the minute I stepped over, it was like the Holy Spirit said, Now come on, we're fixing to do something here. And my shift went from collecting money to delivering people. 
It went from the company to the company to the kingdom. Immediately, if you would just take the step in strange situations, quit waiting and start going. He said, as you go, that means you don't go to Africa, you don't go to India, you don't go to Mexico. It says, as you go, be a witness. As you go, every day, be a witness to God. And then this thing that happened, and, and we need, this church needs to be full of freshly delivered, saved people because they live all around you every day. But you've got to have the confidence that when you speak, God speaks. When you're there, the anointing's there. Whenever, and you don't have to be afraid. Isaiah 55, 11, the word will not turn, return to him void. It will accomplish that thing in which it was sent to do. And it's sent through your mouth, Dewey. What I'm saying is this. We're in a serious time. We're in the end times. We're... Any minute something could blow up around you. You need to pray. Release the angels of God. Know who you are. Quit depending on somebody else to pray for you. You look for somebody to pray for. Let me tell you something. You are the called ones of God. You are the ones that God has elevated in this season. You're the one. Quit looking at yourself as just a human being. You are superhuman beings. You see, God's elevated the church. He said, behold, I give you power, authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. I'm telling you what, that house was full of demon activity. The man was crippled in the wheelchair. The house is a disarray. The wife don't know what's going on. The minute God came in, it changed. Everything changed. You carry God. Don't hoard him up. Let him out. And it's still been changing his house every day. He said it's changing daily. One little visit from you will make a difference in somebody's life. Because <laughs> when you visit, God visits. Quit thinking about it's Richard. Quit thinking about it's Justin. Quit thinking about it's Bud. Quit thinking about it's Clark. When you go, God orders your steps. It's God going. Behold, I've given you authority over all demons and serpents and circumstances that would try to cause degradation and lameness and sickness and oppression over societies. You've got the power and authority to change it. Over all the power, the might of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I remember, I know I've said it before, I used to work the crack houses of West Palm Beach, Florida, and all the way down to Miami. We went into crack houses every week, two or three times a week. Pull in, we'd get calls from parents. Our daughter's over at this crack house. We got to get her out. Would you go do it? Sure, we'll go do it. We never one time got hurt. We'd go into those dark crack houses, grab them up by the arm, say, you're going with us, young lady. We're going with us, uh, young man. Who sent you? I said, God and your parents, don't you mess with us. Nobody ever messed with us because we look mean. Well, we found in Hawaii, we went to a luau. I said, look at that thing. He said, when they go into war, they, I mean, they put that, and they got this big deal up there. And then this guy did that on the stage. It scared me. I like to fail plumb under the table. They have a tongue. It looked like that. Why? I mean, they, they had that pain on them, and, and they stuck their tongue out and made that loud shrill. I started thinking, my Lord of mercy, no wonder people had run from them. Big old spear in their hand. Well, when you come, Empowered by Almighty God, your enemies will be afraid and they'll run as in 
Terra. But the church has to be equipped to do it. God is the equipper. The Holy Spirit's the equipper. The Word is the equipper. And the challenge comes tonight. Will you be willing to go? As you go, be a witness. As a matter of fact, let me challenge you with this. Starting with your own family, would you be willing to be bold enough to tell the truth instead of making excuses? Because if you'll tell the truth, the anointing of God will come in and deliver your family. The church too long has been governed by emotion, not by spirit. I want your families delivered. I want them set free. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It talks about all the power, the authority has been transferred from heaven to you. So how could that be? Jesus, sacrificial death and resurrection. He says, I'm giving you the power, the authority. By no means anything will be able to trample you or come against you. But did you know that? Did you believe that? Are you too caught up in your everyday trivia to get with God low enough to see yourself the way God sees you? Or do you just see yourself as a school teacher, Cindy? I'm picking on you, but what I'm saying, so many people don't see the big picture the way God has painted it. Don't limit God by limiting yourself because you're the hands and feet and mouthpiece of God. You've got to understand this is not normal Christianity anymore. This is a great awakening that God is bringing. Some will fall, some will rise. It depends on the choice you make. All authority has been given to you. What will you do with it? Will you moan? Will you groan? Will you gripe about the darkness? Or Brother Sprague used to say, or will you light a candle? We need to be the candle. And everything we touch, light should come. Why? Why? Because you are the elevated church of the living God. Given authority to walk in places that most men could never even think of. Because they've never been challenged to the level of getting outside this human limitation. And getting in faith in the level with God so God can flow through a human being. Supernaturally. Walk in a few houses and see them get instantly saved and healed and it will encourage you. But if you don't go, you won't know. Amen. I'm telling you what, I'm glad I got you guys. Most everybody else would already run out the door. Praise God, y'all are tough. You better be tough in this season. Because your faith will be challenged. And that's why God sent me here to teach faith. It's not a one-time situation. You see, it's an ongoing thing to keep you energized, to keep you excited, to keep you knowing who you are and that all things are possible to the man or woman who can believe. That's faith. Amen? So y'all encourage me by not running out the door. I want to encourage you by continuing
to give an uncompromised word of God in a challenge that who you are, you're called of God. You're men and women called now. Quit looking at yourself as the unemployed carpenter or as the school teacher or the president of something or the mechanic or the retired person. Look at yourself as a man or woman given authority of God to represent him in the earth like never before. You see, the things that will try to distract you as temptation tries to enter in. This says, defraud you not one another except it be the consent for a time talking about men and women comes together you need to pray you need to do that but you need to consider one another and sin is number two Satan is the originator of rebellion and the biggest sin in the church is rebellion I told uh, Justin tonight I said you ever follow played follow the leader We used to play that all the time when we was little kids. Follow the leader, and we'd go in circles and go out and come back, and you had to hook up, and everybody had to stay in line. It might not be a bad idea in this dispensation, in this season, to play follow the leader. God calls the leaders, not men. Amen? And then... Deception is one of the greatest powers the devil will bring your past up or when it seemingly you failed or your future, it doesn't look like there's any hope. He'll try to bring it up and deceive you and let that be the number one paramount thing in your thinking instead of God has already delivered you. He has already made the way. Second Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his uh, cunningness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's talking about this is a simple thing to trust God. Quit trying to make so much out of it. Just trust him. Trust him at his word. Walk forward with him. Don't be deceived in thinking that we got to come up with some kind of concoction to make this work. The concoction is this. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Accusation. Satan urges, he hurls accusations against the saints continually to try to rob you of your, your ability, your, your strength, your faith. He tries to, in Revelation 12.10, it says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God night and day. He does not have the ear of God anymore on your behalf. No more. The only ear he can have is yours. God already sees you delivered and set free. Accusation, affliction, he seeks to afflict. And he's even painted the picture to the almighty church of the living God. When you make a statement that everyone in the church should be living in divine health, people get mad. Don't make any difference if you are living in health. It doesn't change the truth. The truth is maybe that could give us something to shoot at. Maybe there is no sickness in the covenant. There's no sickness in the kingdom of heaven. I've had Christians, good one, ask me, well, how are we going to die then? Well, just get old. Good grief. Get 120 and say, well, son, I think it's time to get out of here. I'll see you up in the next stage and let your staff fall down, let your spirit go and go on be at the Lord and quit. A whole lot better than dying with cancer, tuberculosis, TB, de uh, demonized uh, AIDS, uh, uh, some kind of horrible blood disease or, or, or some other kind of horrible. It would be a lot better just to live 120 years, be productive, never retire, just serve God in the kingdom the whole time, and then just evacuate, get out of here. I know that's far-fetched because we quit teaching 
the provision of the elevated church to walk in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus and be free like the children of Israel were when they left Egypt. You say, well, I don't think I can buy into that. That's what's wrong with the church. We're not being willing to stretch our faith beyond where he, God even told Abraham, stretch your tent flap, get the, the card stiff, and get those pegs in the ground. Get your vision bigger. And the vision is not having 150,000 churches in the world. The vision is to have one church walking in divine health. <laughs> and we've got two now that's debt free. I mean more than that, but uh, Mary Burton, since we've been having the debt demolitions, debt free. Ron is debt free. And by faith, I'm debt free. By faith, I'm debt free. Amen? But what's wrong with us just believing God to the uttermost? Is it embarrassing if something, if you come up like me and believe in God, a faith teacher, and my kid die? They don't stop you from preaching the gospel. That has no bearing on the rest of you. I don't understand that. If God said it, let's take it and run with it. I don't care if you come in on a three-legged scooter trying to get around up here at the altar to pray. It has no bearing on the covenant. The covenant says by his stripes we were healed. And we need to start believing it, getting out in the realm of the unseen while we're still probably embarrassed sometimes. I mean, my wife's home. I prayed for her before we left that she would be healed, and I believe she's healed right now. But the thing about it is, it didn't stop me from coming preaching healing and faith and deliverance and going with the full covenant power of God. You are the elevated church. Amen? I believe somebody will hear me and want me to come preach in London. going to say where'd that good preaching from right out of the depths of the Holy Ghost I have nothing planned normally when I preach let me tell you something you say well we could tell that no <laughs> always have an outline but I hardly ever follow it but the thing about it is you're the church that's been elevated by almighty God to do mighty exploits now but you'll never do them until you believe that and I will guarantee you this. The minute you take the step to do that, the enemy will come to test your faith. Amen? Opposition. He is involved in a great spiritual war against God in his kingdom, so he wants to bring opposition against you because you represent the kingdom. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion. He didn't say he was. He just said, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It would be hard to find somebody in this church to devour. Why? Because you've got knowledge of who you are. You've got knowledge that you've been elevated. You've got knowledge that he's been stripped. Jesus come to defeat and destroy the works of the devil. So he has no authority anymore in your life. So he'd have a hard time getting over on you because you trust God, you know your right position with God, and you know God's the one that placed you there. Amen? And then death was the greatest power Satan had. Hebrews 2 is back again. For as much then as the children partakes of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Let me tell you something. We must always remember that Jesus came to the earth for one reason, that was to destroy the works of the devil and bring salvation to mankind. He did this for us. Jesus conquered Satan. You don't have to. and made us more than conquerors over him in our life today. You, we feel like we have to conquer Satan. We don't have to conquer him. He's already conquered him. We walk in the victory by faith. 
You don't have to get into your warring closet and defeat the devil because he's already defeated. Get in your warring closet and defeat the doubt in your own mind. And when you're in your closet, you ought to pray out loud and say, I'm a man of God, I'm a child of God, I'm a woman of God. He's put me over, he's elevated me. I have right thinking. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. I will walk out of this closet and I will be so powerful and strong in the power of God. There ain't no devil. They'll all run as in terror when they just see me show up. Why? Because God's in you, Tim. You see... I know we've got to get out on the cutting edge. I know for this day, we've been trained for this day. But all of you's been put here because you got to be pushed over the edge. <laughs> well, you got to get all on that spiritual faith limb. You got to get out there where if God don't rescue you, you ain't gonna be rescued because you're walking by faith. But you know what? When you walk by faith, you got no problems because. Faith activates the will of God and the provision of God. Amen. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to continue this, I think, Sunday. Because I think we have got a group of men and women here that realize that God elevated the church and you're the church. And that these neighborhoods that we live in no longer will belong to the devil but will belong to God. Do you understand me? I want us to stand out. I don't want to be a quiet little old group of people at a quiet little old church. I want us to sing this story to the housetops. I want religious spirits to flee every time they see us coming. And that God be God and he manifest in our presence and out in the earth like never before. And that he begins to speak to us like he is my niece in, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, giving her dreams every night, getting her so ignited. And that was a sovereign move. I ask that the book of Joel comes alive and that it actually manifests now in this season. And I ask that God will impregnate you with a desire and it will give birth to faith like never before that you will actually be so fed up with mediocrity in your own life and in the church that you're willing to change and let God be God again in the church of the living God. I'm telling you, God's in this thing. God is alive. He is, we know if we will just think. We've all of us been in church for a 100 years and we know change has to come. And it's got to come from God Almighty through us. And that comes by trust and obey through faith in the true and living God. Father God, let the anointing of God be strong on this congregation of men and women. The church that you have elevated, let it manifest this week and the weeks to come as men and women that carry the great commission at the forefront of their life and that demons begin to cast out and, and run and flee and hands are beginning to be laid on sick men and women and instantly they're healed. And let this anointing that's on my hands right now go through this congregation and let it be so tangible that they will jump when it even begins to manifest and let it be so real so activated by faith tonight that wherever we go, starting with their own families, they will fall before Almighty God and sovereignly begin to move toward Him. In Jesus' name, Almighty. Amen and amen. <sighs> Praise God. That's about it, guys. I am so fired up by the Holy Ghost, I can't tell you what I feel inside of me. People are hungry for what you've got. They are hungry for God. 
Aren't you glad you got born in this season? You could have been born in the dark ages, but you just happened to be born in the most light that's ever come to the earth, and it's coming through you. Amen. Well, bring somebody with you Sunday. We're going to have a great time. Men's meeting, women's meeting Saturday. I want to have a uh, a get-together with all of our men and women. What Saturday was that, Ruth? The 6th of August. We'll have a regular...